Yes, thanks, Steve. Uh, hello and welcome to today's Real Experts webinar, The Biggest Mistakes Coaches Make and How to Fix Them. And it's presented by the gentleman you see on the screen, Steve Strickholm, the founder and president of KDNA Goal Tracker Software Company. Now, today's webinar is interactive, which means we want to hear from you. So after Steve's initial presentation, we will open up the webinar to your questions. So if you please use the chat room to ask any questions you may have, we will do our best to answer them today. So with that said, I want to thank you all for joining us and turn things over to Steve. And thank you too, Steve, for coming and presenting. You bet, Jane. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Steve Strickholm. I'm the president and founder of KDNA, or Knowledge DNA Goal Tracking Software Company. And in the last uh, four to five years, we've worked with tens of thousands of real estate professionals, mostly real estate agents, but also loan officers and title company reps all around the country. Uh, we've been used by hundreds of managers and coaches, over a thousand real estate teams. And what we're going to talk about today is how to diagnose and fix the biggest mistakes that we've seen in working with hundreds of coaches and managers and helping their real estate professionals become more successful in business as part of their coaching and training process. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So why do we do coaching? Well, we're here as coaches, uh, trainers, mentors to help agents launch and advance their careers and, and doing the key skills that will create success. And why is this important? Well, it turns out that after one year, about 75% of agents are uh, either not making the income they need or have left the business. And that number is 87% after five years. That's a huge dropout rate. And so our job as coaches, instructors, trainers, is to help agents activate the right kind of skills so they're among the people who are surviving in the business. So we need to get our people to do what the 87% are not doing in order to reach their career goals. And our job is to help them increase the number of income producing activities, we call these IPAs, income producing activities they're doing on a week to week, month to month basis. And so as we go through different coaching sessions with them, we should be seeing an increase and, and, and we should see them building momentum in their business because they're focusing more on their IPAs and they're doing more of them. So <clears throat> let's go through our mistakes. What are, what are the five things that these are five, by the way, five things that we see coaches uh, uh, doing that uh, get things off the rails. So the first mistake, biggest mistake is we see people teaching, not coaching. Uh, people come into this business as, uh, let's say, trainers or maybe helping people get their licensing or continuing education. And that's all about giving people information uh, rather than helping them change their behavior. So teachers, I like to say teachers tell, they're, hel they're helping their folks master content, but coaches ask. They're helping people master behavioral change. It's really different regurgitating content for a test than changing your behavior so you talk to more people, build relationships, and create more income for yourself and your company. So um, the teaching sign would be you're talking more than they do. Uh, here's one example I heard. Uh, let's go over the best kind of carpeting to install if you're trying to sell a house. Well, that's a training. That's a teaching. That's not a coaching process. You're solving the problems for them. And by the way, installing carpeting in a house is not a key activity <laughs> that an agent continually needs to engage in in order to build momentum in their business. <clears throat> so coaching sign, coaching signs to be asking questions. Uh, what goals did you achieve since our last session? What challenges did you face? Uh, and what changes have you made? And by the way, what successes did you have? What did you learn from those successes? And how are you going to implement the changes from the challenges or the successes that you've had? How are you going to implement and continue those behaviors in your daily, weekly, monthly lifestyle? So I like to say that teachers get you a grade, but coaches help you get paid. I like that. So actually, I made that up. So <laughs> you can go ahead and use that. Um, <clears throat> mistake number two. Is, is not using repetition to build a solid foundation in their skill, uh, in their skill behavior. So here's how not to build a foundation. Focus on a different skill every session and move down their pipeline before their earlier skills are in place, before we've got them contacting people. We're, we're teaching them and, and doing enough contacting to build a business. We're teaching them all the intricacies of a listing presentation. Well, it's great to do that. But first of all, they got to have people to talk to, and let's let them get a listing appointment set up, and then they got a real motivation in the next couple of days to come in and learn how to do that listing presentation. Of course, you can be talking about it beforehand, but the idea is build that foundation so you don't confuse and frustrate your agents and have them fire you. <clears throat> so I thought I'd give a personal example here. Uh, 
My wife and I, we do ballroom dancing. It means we do like uh, rumba and foxtrot and swing and, and, and uh, waltz and, and those kinds of smooth and rhythm dances. So we decided that we wanted to take a country western dance. And by the way, I live in Southern California, so we get a fair number of country western dances out there or bands. So we show up to the class and you can learn maybe two or three moves in a one hour class and not get overwhelmed. So in the first 45 minutes, the, uh, the dance coach uh, has us learn four or five new moves. Now, 45 minutes is gone. Now, what he should do is he should have re us repeat those four or five moves over and over and over again so we instill that in our, in our uh, memory and in our physical uh, motor memory as well. But no, he says, oh, great, we got 15 minutes left. I'm going to give you three more moves to learn. So at the end of the session, we've had seven new skills thrown at us. We don't remember a thing. We're totally confused. After two sessions, my wife and I stopped taking the class, and we talked to a lot of other people that had stopped and dropped out from his class as well. So the guy has lost a lot of income. We actually even, I actually even talked to him. I said, look, you're losing a lot of people because you're going to, you're not repeating what you're teaching us. And he's like, okay, okay. So in the second class, same thing happened. He's done four new moves. And I could see him just thinking in his brain, I shouldn't do this, but he couldn't hold himself back. And he goes, now I'm going to teach you three more. <laughs> so we're like, okay, this guy, you know, he's not, he can't learn. He's not willing to learn to be a successful coach. And it really hurt his business. So that's how to confuse people and how to get them to fire you. Okay, so, so sales is like a physical activity. We, it's like sports. There's a heavy competition for rewards. Nobody's guaranteed to win. And you have to execute the same skills, contacting, setting appointments, presentations, lead generating over and over again, just like in sports. So you got continuous repetition and you have to do those repetitions to build a foundation over time. So let's take an example, lead generating. Now we know that's the top of your pipeline. If you don't generate leads, you don't have appointments and you don't make any sales. So part of that process is developing scripts so you're comfortable with knowing how you're going to talk to people in different kinds of environments. And uh, I know for me, gosh, I edited and worked, well, I practiced my scripts dozens and dozens of times, and I edited them, uh, changed them probably 20, 30, 40 times. So critical skill. How many times are you practicing your scripts and updating your scripts? For example, uh, when you're on the phone with a new prospect or calling and talking to one of your sphere of influence folks and wanting to see if you can get some referrals or leads. Or then doing a follow-up to somebody that uh, maybe you met at an open house or when you're at an open house, your first meeting. And then what's your script and listing appointments and so forth. So these are, um, these are the kinds of uh, skills that we need to instill in people, have them work on and build through repetition over and over again. Because we're coaching people through all four stages of the sales pipeline. You got to prepare, uh, you got to do you know, scheduling and time management, and you've got to do lead generating uh, with the time that you're putting in, create appointments and out of those appointments, create sales. And repetition is required in all four stages of the sales pipeline. So here's a favorite quote. Uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not just one act, but it's a habit. And we're going to talk about what a habit is a little bit down the road. The difference between uh, unconscious incompetence and unconscious competence, which is what a habit is. So <clears throat> mistake number three is that we don't objectively measure progress of our folks. Here's a quote from one of our uh, great coaches who said, high producers operate in reality. So again, what do we mean by that? Well, again, sales is a physical activity. There's heavy competition. You have to execute everything over and over again. And let's say that you were coaching an athlete and uh, you said uh, to a baseball player, uh, what's your batting average? Or to uh, a track and field star or a person uh, who wants to become a star, what's your fastest time in running a mile? And what are your splits? What are your you know, 400 meter splits? Or a basketball player, what's your shooting percentage? And if they came to you and they said, I want you to coach me, and you said, well, so what is your shooting percentage? And, uh, you know, uh, free throw, three pointers, you know, you know, and so forth. And they said, I don't know. Well, how can you coach that person? You really can't. So then again, let's apply that to real estate. So can you coach this agent? How many hours of lead generating have you done in last week? How many two-way conversations are you having? How many eight contacts do you have in your database? Or do you have a database? <laughs> And they say, I don't know. So how do you coach somebody like this? It becomes very, very difficult because you don't know where to start. Um, well, here's what will happen. You'll get on a coaching call. How was your week? Oh, my week was great. What did you do? Well, I was really busy, man. I know I talked to a lot of people and I just you know, was walking around and I gave out my cards to some people in the supermarket. 
Okay, well, that's busy, but it's not focused and it's not doing the things that are going to build your business. Because here are the things that will build an agent's business. These are the key goals that they have to track. It all starts with hours of lead generating. How many hours of lead generating are you doing? And by the way, we're going to talk about conversion ratios a little bit that we've uh, 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 created, that we've actually computed based upon working with thousands of agents around the country. So it all starts with hours of lead generating. And then how many conversations are you having with folks? Uh, uh, follow-ups, initial contacting with people, sphere of influence, all of that, you know, those are two-way conversations that are key to your business. Then how many uh, key people, A-list people, are you contacting in your database and how many people are you following up? Because we know if people don't follow up, the, the, uh, the river runs dry, right? And you've got to, uh, you know, the average sale is made after 5, 10, you know, 20 conversations. If you drop the relationship after your first or second attempt, it's very unlikely you're going to make a, a career in this business. So you need to go from I don't know to I know. Okay, so let's talk about tracking and why it's important. This is a university study that took uh, 250 business professionals and they, they divided them randomly into two groups. In the first group, they said, you're going to go through the week thinking about your goals, week after week, month after month. And the second group, you're going to be the tracking group. And uh, I'll talk briefly about what they did, the four, the four steps that they took. And they, they, they looked at these people week after week, month after month, and they found that the people that just thought about their goals uh, in their business over and over again uh, only achieved about 43% of their goals. And I think a 43% grade is an F uh, in, in the world and in business. Uh, and the tracking group achieved, on average, over three quarters of their goals. So they were almost 80% more productive than the thinking group. And these were the four steps that they implemented in their goal tracking. They wrote down their weekly goals. So you got to have it written down physically present in front of you on a daily basis. Then you have to track your progress towards your weekly goals daily during the week. You have to have a weekly progress report. So it's not like you just put the numbers down and, for, and you, you didn't, didn't actually look at, did I meet my goals or not? Because you're afraid to do that. You're, account, you're, you're operating in reality. Remember that first quote? You're operating in reality and you're saying, oh man, I hit 40% or I hit 120%. I did great or I need to improve in this area. Being honest with yourself, a weekly progress report. And then being accountable to somebody else or a group of other people and sharing your results with them. And that's where we come in, obviously, as coaches. But also people are, you know, they have uh, colleagues that they work with. They might be on a team. Uh, they might have a manager that they're, uh, you know, involved with and working with. So, uh, or even a spouse, right? Uh, honey, uh, I know uh, we got to make our mortgage uh, next month. So here are all the things I'm doing to make sure that we can do that because I'm really investing the time and energy in my business. And I'll actually talk about my personal uh, experience with that in example in just a few minutes. So those are the four steps to goal tracking. Now, we've actually at KDNA, we've done our own studies. And here's one uh, real estate office that we had 30 agents uh, that we were tracking. And half of them were, were really, uh, you know, doing the things I just talked about, doing their tracking and being accountable to other people and hitting their weekly goals and working towards them. And the other half of the people were just like poking at it with a stick and really not committed to tracking. And what we found month after month is uh, when we looked at quarterly results, the people that were poking at their accountability, like with a stick, were making a little over 60000 a year. And the people that were, that were committed to tracking were making almost 150000 a year. Again, it's not a 10 or 20% difference to track your numbers and be accountable to yourself and others. It's a, it's a 30, 50, 80% number. It's a much bigger number. So we know that the, the, the more that you track your goals, the more your income is going to be. We know there's a direct relationship between those two. Now, here's what I did when I was first starting out. And by the way, I've had a real estate license and an insurance broker license. And I'm also a licensed psychology professional in the state of California, which was my first career doing rehabilitation uh, goal tracking uh, and helping people with uh, lifelong disabilities, young adults who were uh, had uh, major mental illness or mental retardation, helping them find and keep jobs and housing in the community. And we did paper-based goal tracking to help them adopt all the skills they needed to deinstitutionalize and live out in the real world. And that had dramatic impact on their quality of life. So when I went into my business and I had to make a living because I it was commission only, I um, I started doing paper-based goal tracking. And this is an example where you can each each time you, you make a call or you try to have a conversation, you 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 uh, you know you put a line through the number and every time you 
reach somebody, you circle it, and at the end of the day, you can see exactly how many one-way, two-way uh, contacts you had and how many hours you did that. I mean, this is the key to being successful in the business. And then, uh, then I converted this in, into our Katie Nagel Tracker, which is an online application and works through uh, PCs and smartphones. And this is just a screenshot on the left of what the Goal Tracker looks like um, in a smartphone, and then the right side, all that data from every individual goes into an online coaching dashboard. Uh, it's all color-coded red, yellow, green. So just like a stoplight, you can see how your folks are doing. So here's a favorite quote from another one of our coaches. Goal tracking stops my people from hallucinating that they are actually working. And we'll talk about that in a minute, too, as well. So mistake number four out of five is not giving continuous feedback. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, without continuous feedback, agents are going to go in circles. They're not going to get getting the course correction from you because they're going to be trying things that won't work. They're not going to improve their skills. They're going to get frustrated, and they're going to be that 75 or 87% of the people that, that quit the business or aren't successful. So what we do as coaches is we need to go through a process that we call the skill activation loop, where when you have a session, there are three things you're doing. Uh, we're looking at results and accountability since the last time we met. Then we're looking at a new skill learning that you're gonna uh, that you want to adopt. That you want to you know increase your um, uh, you know your um, production in your business. And then we're gonna set a way for you to execute and goal track on that. So when we come back to our next session, we can look at your results in learning this new skill and integrating it into your business uh, practice. So it's a three-step process. The, you know the, the the first part of the session is follow up. Did you meet your last week's goals and what successes and challenges did you uh, face? What did you do? What did you learn? And what new habits can you add uh, going forward? And then we're advancing your skills. So, okay, we've looked at what happened and, and now, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of open houses and we know that uh, you need to work on some scripts for approaching people at open houses. You've got three leads, or actually you've got three, not leads even, you got three people's names, <laughs> last open house, and one phone number. So the goal was we want five names with all their contact information at your open house this Sunday. So we're going to talk about how you can do that and uh, and get that skill embedded and you get you practicing on that. And then now how are you going to implement that skill at the open house or whatever skill we're working on? And what goal are you going to set? Okay, five people at the next open house on Sunday. I'm going to get all their contact information and I'm going to hand, send them a handwritten note. I can't tell you how many handwritten notes I do not receive uh, from agents. I get maybe one a year and it's like one of the golden things that you can do to build a business. So <clears throat> what if my agents get stuck? Well again, don't talk at them. Ask questions so they talk to you. If they're not being accountable, well, so why are you missing the deadlines and what's going on with you're not calling your leads? Um, you know, maybe it's time management or it's, or in a lot of cases it's fear. You know, we're afraid of rejection. And so, you know, as we know, success in sales, a lot of that is psychology, you know, like three quarters of it is belief. If you believe you can do it, you will, you will take the act and then you're going to start seeing the results and now it becomes a self-perpetuating positive cycle. So why, what's going on with not contacting the leads and how come you're not using the tools like, you know, goal tracking and so forth. And then, of course, we get stuck too as coaches. So uh, holding myself accountable. Well, am I, how many sessions am I prepared for? Uh, how many of my agents are actually setting goals and tracking their goals? And am I asking them questions about their successes and about their challenges and about their behavior changes? Questions not, you know, not talking to them, but listening uh, to them from what they're saying to me. And do I always end my sessions with what's the plan between now and the next session? Uh, you know, as salespeople, we know uh, to not end a meeting with a prospect without booking our next meeting, right? So it's the same. It's the same idea. These are our, these are our clients. These are our prospects also. So we want to end a session with. Uh, we already know when we're meeting with them next. So what we want to do is we want to book the goal for the next session. Okay, just like we book the next time with our prospect, we book the goal for the next session with our with our uh, coaching client. So uh, actually, in KDNA, we have goal trackers for our coaches where you can set up your key coaching skills you want to track, and then you can track it uh, daily towards your weekly goals on your smartphone or your PC, and it's, again, color-coded uh, red, yellow, green, and blue. Uh, green is 100% uh, like uh, go at a stoplight. Okay, so again, the skill activation loop then applies to agents and coaches. So we have to live this model ourselves if we're going to apply it to our clients, our agents. Okay, mistake number five, not providing guidance over time. So what do we mean by that? Well, here's how not to guide people long-term. You set up a four to six week training program, then you cut them loose. 
Uh, you, you give them a cubicle, you, let's say you're, you're a broker, you sit back in your office and you wait for transaction problems to occur and you try to keep them out of legal trouble, but everything else in between is their problem. So uh, you don't go back and review the key skills, so they abandon their base skills, they don't have a system and they don't feel your commitment to follow through, and what you do is after the four or six week learning curve, you now set up an unlearning curve. So it goes up and it goes, you know, it goes down. So <laughs> that's not where we want to go. So again, our primary job is to get the 87% who are likely not going to make it into business. We're, we want to get those people uh, that we're responsible for doing the things that are going to get their income goals. Because most Asians don't succeed and we want to activate their skills so they're among uh, the, the wonderful folks that create their own uh, business and lifestyle. Because we know that that you know real estate is a wonderful opportunity, but it's a complicated set of skills. You've got to do prospecting and have social engagement skills. <clears throat> you got to have time management. You got to negotiate. You got to use technology, and you have to do cash management. You know there are a lot of agents that oh great I got a ten thousand dollar commission check I just made a sale. I'm going to spend the money this month. Well, the next sale is three months from now. So now they're they're broke or they're going bankrupt and can't make their mortgage and they quit and they go find a, a cubicle job for 20 bucks an hour with 3% raise a year. All right, we, that's not what we want them to go. So we have to help them with all these skills. Again, they're required in all four stages of the sales process. So one of the things about real estate is, is a, there's a long time frame for success. You have to invest in a lot of relationships. The great majority of those are not gonna buy from you. So you know, I've got 20, let's say a person's got 200, 300, 400 people in their database that are legitimate leads. Well, they're not all gonna buy a house from you. Maybe 10% will and over the next five years, and you're going to be getting new leads as you develop uh, your, your uh, database as well. So there can be, uh, there's no idea, we have no idea which of all these people are investing time in and energy and are going to pay off in its many months to a paycheck. Now, how do we know that? So I told you earlier we were going to talk about conversion ratios, having worked with thousands of agents. We've looked at the data nationwide. And this is what we see in terms of the average agent's amount of activity needed to create a sale. You can see here uh, it's 30 hours of lead generating and about 162-way conversations. Now, an expert agent can be doing this in half that, particularly if they're working off a lot of referrals. And a new, a completely new agent, the numbers could be higher. Again, these are average nationwide. If you're in Beverly Hills, I'll just tell you these numbers are double this uh, because there's so much competition for these $30,000 commissions. Okay, so you got to do more work to get the $30,000 commission. But this is, you know, what you're going to work for for, for a six, eight, ten thousand dollar commission. 163 conversations. That's where it all starts, because we do the hours of lead generating, we have the conversations, and and even if we're really bad at, at that, if we're doing a lot of activity, we're getting a lot of experience. We're going to rapidly get better at having those conversations and building relationships and moving people towards a buyer or a listing appointment. <clears throat> but we have to have the conversations in order to practice our scripts and to, and to have the volume to uh, create momentum in our pipeline. So here's the time frame for success. If a new agent has to do 240 conversations and they're doing 40 a week, which is pretty good, that's six weeks to build up the momentum for a future sale. So it's, it's months to paycheck. And then how do I coach to this process? Well, that's why we got to stick with people long term. It's not a two, four, six week process. We've really got to work with people through this and get their momentum up over the, over the next six to 12 months or longer. So uh, I was going to tell you a story about me. So um, when I left my job as a rehabilitation uh, social worker psychologist, uh, I had no income and I had, had a real estate license and an insurance broker's license. And so my wife was building a business and I uh, joined with her. And uh, so if I didn't make any income, uh, we were not going to have a house to live in or I have to go live with my parents, which was completely unacceptable to me because <laughs> I wouldn't have my wife moving in with me if I did that. So um, <clears throat> I knew that I had to make 400 con three to 400 calls a week all right, in order to have enough conversations to, to put enough momentum in my pipeline. So if it was Sunday afternoon and I'd only made 250 conversations, I could either go out in my deck and barbecue, see, so, you know, call, don't barbecue. I could either go barbecue or I could go in my office for two hours, do 100, 150 calls, uh, talk to a dozen or so people and set two or three appointments for the coming week. So I always made the commitment. I went into the office. I didn't barbecue. I went and I, I spent that time. I did those calls. And in the first year, I made over $100,000 in commission income. So that's what it takes. But I did that for a year, year and a half, and I, I really built a lot of momentum in my business. That's what it takes. So what we're talking about in this overall process, I told you I would give you a brief uh, a little 
uh, bit here on habits, is that we start out with bad habits, which is unconscious incompetence. So we're stupid and we don't know it. <laughs> we're doing you know, bad things. We're not calling people on the phone. We're, oh, we're getting onto our uh, CRM system and we're spending two or three hours managing and moving people around and putting people in different categories, but we never actually pick up the phone and call people very much, okay? So that's, uh, that's a bad habit. Then we become conscious that we're incompetent. So that's not where the coach comes in or we say, oh man, I'm not making the income that I want. I'm not getting the appointments that I want. I don't have the pipeline that I want. What's going on? All right, well, let's talk about what you need to do. You're gonna be doing new skills. You're gonna be acting in new, you're gonna be acting in new ways and it's gonna feel uncomfortable. And that's called conscious competence. It's uncomfortable, but you're doing new things. You're doing well, but it takes work. I always got to think my way through it, like in, like in dance, okay? In ballroom dancing, you start out, or our teacher says it takes three hours to learn one new move, and you got to do it about 50 times, okay? So we, you start doing the right thing, but it takes work, and then after a while, you do it enough times, you, become, you have a new habit, which means you are now unconsciously competent. You do a good job automatically. So every day, you know, if you, it's like brushing your teeth. Like if I don't brush my teeth, I probably go to bed at night, I, I just I feel unclean. No, <laughs> not quite. But it just doesn't feel right, so I got to do it. And so we want to get to the point, if they're not doing two hours of lead generating every day, maybe in the morning, it doesn't feel right. They just can't get away with not doing it. So they pick up the phone in the afternoon, and they put in those hours like I did on Sunday afternoons. Okay? So the questions for long-term success, you want to protect their investment in their business and your investment in them and avoid the unlearning curve. Are you focusing on the activity you need to? Are you implementing the skills, tracking your results, and changing your behavior? That's the cycle we've talked about. So here's an example of what to do and not to do. If people are not tracking and you meet with them or call them and say, how was your week? They say, hey, I was really busy, man. I walked a dog. I went to the dry cleaners. I picked up my groceries, went to the gym, talked to a couple people about real estate, handed out a couple of cards. Okay. Well, let's see. Did you call people uh, on your lead list? Did you follow up? Did you did you talk to people in your sphere of influence, hold an open house, a farm or door knock, uh, whatever it is that is your lead generating plan? Did you uh, <clears throat> accept that plan and did you commit to it and did you hit your markers and your goals for that plan? That's what, that's what we're talking about in terms of uh, uh, really focusing on and building your business. So let's review the five biggest mistakes. Teach, don't coach, don't repeat, just move on and don't, don't establish the skills. Don't measure progress. Don't give them continuous feedback so they can, uh, uh, they can learn from you and, 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 and move their uh, skill levels forward. And then just cut them loose and don't provide guidance over time. Those are the five biggest mistakes we see coaches making nationwide. So let's talk about real quickly again, what's the fix? First of all, uh, coach, don't teach. P teachers tell, coaches ask. Our job is to get them to master behavioral change because teachers get you a grade, but coaches get you paid. <laughs> all right, we want to build through repetition. We want to have them add new skills <clears throat> when we've uh, mastered the previous ones uh, and keep them motivated. Uh, third, we want to measure uh, their progress objectively. These are the key skills we talked about. We know that uh, goal tracking makes people a lot more productive. You can use a paper-based goal tracker or a system like ours, uh, an income-producing activity tracker that works on smartphones and PCs and creates a coaching dashboard. Four, you want to give continuous feedback so they don't go in circles and their skills improve, and they keep hiring you for coaching because here's your skill activation loop that applies to both them and you. And then a fifth, we want to provide guidance over time in all these key areas. Okay. Remember again, the most important thing is getting enough activity to build a pipeline, momentum in that pipeline, and have enough activity so you can learn from your mistakes, your failures, and people that, that didn't uh, uh, set an appointment with you or didn't uh, you didn't get the listing or buyer agreement from, okay? And we do all this so we can help agents activate the skills that are not gonna put them in the 75 or 87% bucket of people that are not successful in this industry. And in order to do that, they have to, through our help and their own commitment and willingness to change and risk, they increase their income producing activities and they see success in the business. So here again, the, the big, uh, our biggest successes coming from this fix are coach don't teach, uh, build through repetition, measure progress, give feedback and provide guidance over time. Because what we want to do is help them advance their career through the key skills that will create success. And over time, this is what we want to see in our agent's um, six, uh, calendar. In the morning, they're doing two hours of, or three hours of lead generating. And you know what that does? That gives them the ability to go to a soccer kids game in the afternoon because now they're creating income and they own their own business. But it's more than just about time, uh, about money. It's about owning your own time and being able to do the things that you love or just kicking back with the people that you care about, your family, friends, and and best, uh, best friends around the world. So 
Uh, there's our, our website at uh, kdna.com. You can always go there. Uh, there's a contact us button with any information and there's some stuff you can look at there. And then any other uh, ways we can help you, you know, resources, if you want to copy the uh, contact sheet, um, call and contact sheet, you can email us at support at knowledgedna.com or you can go to our website. So uh, that's our presentation today. Uh, we're now going to do a Q&A session. I'm going to turn it over to Jane and find out what questions you folks have been asking as we've been having this great conversation together. So Jane, I'm going to turn it over to you for a second. What do we got? Great. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, your first question is, what are some tips to help me change from teaching to coaching? Okay. So, well, so again, this is, remember that, uh, that, uh, that guy that I was talking about, the, the um, uh, coach uh, who was doing the, the, the Western dance class. So what you really have to do is you have to monitor your own behavior, right? And so you have to go from having unconscious bad habits to doing something that might feel uncomfortable, but that is a success building habit, and then doing that over and over again so that it becomes a, hab a positive habit for you. So, you know, monitor how much time you're talking. Uh, and are you telling them things or are you asking them things? There's, there's, really, there's really four key parts to a, a successful coaching uh, session, which is what happened uh, last week objectively, you know, measurably. What, what did you do? What goals did you have? What did you achieve? Okay, what did you work on? What were your challenges and, and what did you learn from those or what got in the way? What successes did you have and what can we learn from that and what can you continue doing even more of? And then taking those learnings, what is our new skill that we're learning and implementing between now and our next session and how are you going to uh, track that goal and that behavior? So it's always about what happened, uh, what were the challenges, what were the successes, what, do you, what was learned there, what are we adding now into your skill repertoire, and then how are you going to hold yourself accountable to it uh, over the next week or two so that we can talk about it together objectively the next time we meet. So that's the basic process. You have to change. You have to manage. You're in charge. You have to manage the coaching session. You can't leave it up to them. I mean, if you're coaching a baseball player, baseball player says, well, how do I hit better? You say, I don't know, just keep swinging. I mean, <laughs> you know, okay, look, we're going we're gonna to give you some curveballs, some fastballs. We're going to look at what you hit, what you don't hit, where you place the ball, and then we're going to know exactly what skill set we need to work on. So that's, you have to structure the coaching session. Uh, it's up to you to make that, that difference, and, there, and, and these are the ways you do it. Okay, what are the questions that we have, Jane? Okay, another question is, when building a skills foundation, is there a particular good place to start? <clears throat> Well, yeah, um, that's a great question. So, in in my mind, um, I used to think that there were three there were three steps uh, to the sales process. There was lead generating, appointments, and opening and closing transactions. And then, through working with you know hundreds of coaches and thousands of agents, I began to see we began to see that there's a that there's an initial step called uh, preparation and uh, uh, planning. And so, we actually divide that in, we, into like Three different sections. So one is uh, morning. I would call this morning mindset, where if you get out of bed and you um, grab a cup of coffee and look at all the look at the paper and see all the bad news, and now you're going to pick up the phone and start calling people, you're not in a positive mindset. You're not in a good mood. You're not in a problem-solving space. You're in a problem-absorbing space. So what we what I recommend is that you teach your people to do a, a, a daily morning mindset. And for me, it's I do a gratitude meditation every morning. I spend 10 to 15 minutes with my eyes closed going over what I'm grateful for and being thankful for that. Uh, but you can also do affirmations. Uh, you can do prayer. You can uh, walk your dog. Uh, you can uh, you know, do something that makes you feel really good and centered and positive so that when we get on the phone, we're in a positive mindset. The other thing is to make sure that you do preparation, that if you have appointments uh, the next day that you confirm those, I do that all the time uh, with uh, email or even voice messages if it's really important, uh, confirming appointments and scheduling your calendar, reviewing your calendar uh, the night before and being really ready for, for what you've got the next day. Uh, and then, and then pr a script practicing, uh, uh, making sure that you're familiar with what you need to, the questions and answers you need to give people in the environment that you're going to be talking to people. So that's, that's the preparation, morning mindset and business preparation. And, when, and then once you have that in place, uh, when, then what goes along with it is lead generating. Uh, and that's uh, how many uh, hours of lead generating you're scheduling are you going to commit to and are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? Are you going to do open houses? Are you going to do door knocking? Are you going to be calling people from internet leads or calling your sphere of influence? 
So now you've got to do lead generating, and then when you get those leads, following up with them or contacting them and having a follow-up system. So to me, it all starts with daily morning mindset, business preparation, hours of lead generating, and contacting, and then having a follow-up system for those contacts. If you do that, you're going to have appointments, and you're going to get listings and buyer agreements, and you're going to create sales. If you don't do those critical first parts of the pipeline, uh, it's going to be there's going to be a lot of difficulty in building momentum in your pipeline. So that's that's my recommendation. That's what we see uh, being successful for lots and lots of coaches and thousands of agents when they implement those best practices. Okay, uh, what else we got, Jane? Okay, so. Um, in regards to the parts in the goal tracking, is there a yeah. certain um, part of it that produces the most results? Okay, I didn't hear that. Can you say that again? Sure. Um, in regards to goal tracking, goal tracking, the parts okay. goal tracking um, is there certain parts that produce better, the most results? I'm, I'm still not sure. When you say, what you mean the parts of goal tracking? Um, now, okay. What are the parts what, okay. of goal tracking that produce the most results? Does okay. That make so sense? when they did this study, okay, so they looked at they looked at uh, uh, four things. You write down your goals. You track them daily during the week. Number two. Number three. You have weekly progress report. And four. You share that progress report with others. Those are the four parts. Four parts. <laughs> Got to get these in the camera. Four parts that uh, that make that 80% difference. And what they found is that each time you added one of those four parts, uh, the 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 goal achievement went up 20%. So it's 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 a it's a straight line going going straight up. So if you just write down your goals, you're only going to get like you know 10 or 20% improvement in your goal tracking. If you do all four, you get an 80% improvement. So uh, if you're, look, if you're going to do goal tracking, do them all. Why write down your goals if you're not going to track them? And if you're going to track them, well, be accountable to whether you met your goals or not. Otherwise, you're just hiding from yourself. So have have a weekly report for yourself, and and don't do it in in private where nobody can see and nobody can help you. Be accountable to somebody else. Those all make sense, and when you do that, that's when you get the magical, you know, in this study, 80% increase in in productivity. So that hopefully that that answers the question. All right, what else we got? Great. All right. How do conversion ratios differ around the country? Ooh. Okay. Good question. Well, uh, so if so, you know, what we were looking at there, in terms of the the number of uh, two-way conversations that you need, uh, you know, to uh, to to get a sale, that's like um, you know where you've got let's say a average price point at 250 to 400 thousand dollars. That's kind of you know most of the Midwest and maybe parts of the East Coast and down in Florida. Okay. Uh, so now, it, so and that, that's pretty average. So and that's good. So if you're doing 40 conversations um, a week, uh, you know you're, you're going to be making a sale every month, or every month and a half. And if you're an experienced agent, even less than that. However, now I come from Southern California, so I will tell you that the numbers out there are about double that. And we've even seen agents like down in the Beverly Hills area, new agents doing um, you know 400, 500 uh, conversations in order to create a sale. But that's you know what they're 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 going they're gunning for thirty thousand dollar commissions. These houses are a million and a half, two million or higher. So there's it's really interesting. I'll just say one thing: if you when you monetize the dollar value of a two-way conversation, we find that even though it takes uh, twice as much ac uh, effort to get a sale in California, where the prices are two or three times higher, that it, it's it's the same amount of effort to create a dollar, because where you've got higher priced houses, you get more competition because there are more agents. And where the prices are lower, you've got fewer agents competing for those houses. So what we find is that every nationwide, every two-way conversation on average is worth between $30 and $50. And this is such a great thing. If you look at conversion ratios and you're monetizing the dollar value of these activities in your pipeline, you can go to your, your per, person you're coaching, your agent, and say, okay, if you're doing two hours of lead generating and you talk and we know that the average value of a conversation is 40 bucks, okay? And you talk to 10 people. That day, you put $400 into your revenue pipeline. So if you do that five days a week, and you talk to 10 people, and you're putting $400 into your revenue pipeline every day, that's $2,000 a week. Now that means that you're in track for $100,000 a year income. 
Now, that's a real mind blower because uh, as one of our, we actually have, have attorneys that are in the business, uh, and they've said, they've said to us, look, I'm used to billable hours, and my only billable hours in real estate are the hours I do lead generating. That's what I get paid for, and I get paid a couple hundred bucks an hour for every hour I do lead generating. So, you know, when I, you know, was building a business out of nothing commission only, that's what I looked at. And so I was getting paid for my hours of lead generating and the calls I made and the people I talked to. That was it. If I just paid attention to that and I did enough of it, I was going to make a good income. And like this example where somebody talking to 10 people a day, two or three hours of lead generating can make 100,000 a year. Well, that's what I did. And I made a little over 100,000 in my first year. So uh, that's a, one of the great things you can do with conversion ratios and the reality is to get back to my original point that um, that no kind of no matter where people are anywhere around the country even if it takes 400 500 600 conversations to make a sale in southern california you're still making 40 bucks every time you talk to somebody and that's pretty much true whether you're in kansas city or in los angeles or you know somewhere on the east coast so uh that's a really great question and it's a fascinating uh, discovery that we made in terms of the dollar value of a two-way conversation. Okay, uh, next question. That's great, Steve. Um, okay, we've got time for one more question. Wonderful. How do I build a coaching practice? So uh, would that be, um, so how do I build a coaching practice in terms of uh, how do I do lead generating and how do I uh, attract the people or, or let's say I'm in an office and I want to recruit people into a coaching program where I'm helping them build their business. So I'll assume that uh, this is, uh, you know, we have an office and we want to build a coaching program in our office. So let me just start with that. Uh, because the other one is, look, I'm an independent contractor. Now you're, you're like an agent. You're going out and you're recruiting people's sphere of influence and you're, you're selling your services as a coach to independent agents. So I'll take the other example where I'm in an office. Okay. so. So, well, what you got to figure, well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, uh, well, am I going to be a part-time coach and also a producer? And we have a lot of coaches that do that. Or I'm going to be a full-time coach and I'm not going to be producing. And we have coaches that do that, that are like, well, you know, I was a real estate agent for 30 years and, I'm, and I've moved into a new area, so I really don't have a client base anymore. And I just want to take what I've learned and I really want to mentor, um, you know, other uh, newer agents and teach them what I've learned. So, uh, so let's. So you have to decide: Are you part-time and a producer, uh, or are you going to be full-time? Now, if you are part-time and a producer, you got to make sure that you aren't competing with your agents in terms of time. You have to commit to: Hey, if I'm remember, I went through like where do I get stuck as a coach, and what are my what are my key goals? You know, am I um, am I preparing for each session? Am I making sure that I go through that structure of asking them questions about what they learned and what they're going to change and what their goals are between now and the next session? You know, am I really providing a quality product or am I on the phone trying to run down leads and I've got a transaction problem so I'm not ready to talk to my agent and they're waiting five minutes before I can meet with them? You know, you don't want to get into that situation because you're not going to have a successful coaching practice. So if you're part-time and part-time in both, just make sure you have separation between the two and do a great job in both, uh, in both, both spheres. So the other thing that you need to ask yourself in building a coaching practice is, well, how am I going to get compensated? Uh, and there are kind of two ways that you can do this. Some of our coaches uh, have an agreement where, let's say, for the first three uh, uh, contracts that the agent uh, completes over the first over the year of coaching, that you get a percent of their commission. So it can be a commission-based compensation, or you can charge, you know, so much per month. So uh, you could charge, you know, if you do group coaching. By the way, I just want to say you can do group coaching or individual coaching, or a combination of both. Um, we find that successful coaching often is a combination of the two. So it can be really effective to have like uh, eight or 10 or 15 people in a coaching group where you're meeting with them either, uh, you know, individually or as a live in an office, or you're doing a webinar with them and they're dialing in and you're going over their goals together. Um, and uh, so you're doing a group uh, accountability call every week and then maybe once a month you're doing a one-on-one -on -one call with the people that's a very efficient way to do coaching and then you can charge you know I don't know you know 200 a month for that or you can decide what uh, what you want to charge people two or three hundred a month to be in that program uh, if you're doing only individual one-on-one -on -one coaching you might and you're meeting with people weekly uh, you might charge a little bit more than that uh, you probably will uh, you might even meet with people every other week I will say this, one other kind of golden rule we found is that, is that for people to adopt new skills, 
And to really move forward, you've got to meet with them. You've got to have an accountability session, either individual or in a group, uh, every week. <laughs> because, you know, uh, there's so much that happens. Uh, we've had, maybe you meet with them every two or three weeks, or if you get to them once a month, there's so much that's happened in the meantime uh, that all sorts of debris has flown under the bridge, uh, gone under the bridge, and it's really kind of hard to pick out what was good, what was bad, and, and say, you know, do we have a consistent skill building process that we're really moving you forward uh, week after week, month after month. So really a weekly touch-in, even if it's a group coaching call, is really, really important for skill acquisition. Um, and, you know, so, and, you know, if you look at, well, if you're trying to learn any skill, and if you're practicing it every week and you're getting coaching every week, you're going to, you're not going to uh, learn twice as fast as if you, well, I mean, you're not going to, yeah, you're going to learn like twice as fast as if you are being coached, say, every other week or once a month. So do it consistently, have a weekly touch in. Again, that's that study that said weekly reports, weekly accountability with other people. That's the 80%. You, you take out that, that weekly accountability and you're going to see that 80% uh, get cut in half or more. So that, those are my uh, many suggestions and ideas based on what we've seen and learned from uh, all of our hundreds of coaches we worked with around the country. So, Jane, are, is there anything else that's come up that you want me to comment on from uh, any no, of the uh, No, in, in, re in reality, we're out of time. So um, <laughs> okay. and we, I want to thank you, though, Steve. Your um, <clears throat> information is fab fabulous and, of course, lots of tips to help coaches succeed, and we appreciate that very yeah. much for you coming oh, in. Oh, my, my, my pleasure, my pleasure. Great. Well, I want to uh, let you all know, and thank you all for joining us today. And um, again, thanking Steve for his exceptional presentation. Our Real Experts webinars are a knowledge-based sharing presentation platform designed to bring the most timely, market-sensitive, and proven success strategies to the real estate professionals. We believe you need to be smarter, faster, and stronger than your competition, and we are here to help you continue to grow as real experts. Again, thank you, Steve, and thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Have a great month ahead. Take good care. Bye.